Hello, I'm Lydia Talbot. Welcome to Sanctuary. We're here in the Chapel of St. Anthony at the Greek Orthodox Metropolis of Chicago. Consider this. Western Christians, both Catholic and Protestant, often overlook and even disregard their Eastern brothers and sisters, even when those Christians suffer war and persecution, become refugees, and live among us. In this documentary, His Grace Bishop Demetrius of Mokisos, the auxiliary bishop of the Greek Orthodox Metropolis of Chicago, will introduce us to Eastern Christians who fled war and persecution in their homelands and made their way to Chicago. We'll go inside their homes and places of worship and hear their stories about the rich tradition of ancient Christianity that continues to thrive in a new world. Today on Sanctuary. I think there is a numbness among Western Christians living in the United States when it comes to the refugees and people suffering war in their hometowns in Eastern Christian environments because they're not like them. If the bombings were happening somewhere in the Middle East and we knew that they were attacking Lutherans that worshiped the way Lutherans worship, I think then the Americans would be, oh my goodness, that's terrible. Because they know them. But they don't know the Eastern Christians. In fact, unfortunately, sometimes when Western Christians want to bring Christianity to these people, when in fact they've been Christian long before you were, they were Christians in the first century. And when we ignore the history, and when we don't understand the other as other, then we dismiss them. They're expendable. You're not like me. Therefore, you're not worthy of the attention. It's time to look beyond that. In fact, the Eastern expression of Christianity is, is amazing because when you visit the Assyrian Church of the East, they use Aramaic in their worship. Aramaic is a language that Jesus spoke. I think that's great that these ancient languages, cultures, are alive and well in Chicago. My name is Tina Youssef. I am the principal of Sunday school at Margaret's Church with St. George. Aramaic is the language of Jesus Christ. So it's very important for us to learn it. <laughs> So that's why they, we need our children to learn this language in order when they go listen to the priest, to the pastor, whoever is, you know, doing the service to understand what's going on. I want the other people to know that Assyrians were the first people that converted to Christianity. Since Jesus Christ was here on earth before resurrection, we used to have a king, they call it they call it um, uh, Abgar Okama. Once upon a time, Abgar, king of Edessa, became afflicted with a skin disease. About this time, Abgar heard of a famous healer by the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Wanting to be healed, Abgar wrote a letter to Jesus asking for his help. In exchange, Abgar offered Jesus asylum in his palace. To the king's surprise, Jesus wrote back, commending Abgar for his faith and promising to send Thaddeus, one of Jesus' 72 disciples. Thaddeus journeyed to Edessa and God healed the king. And so, 
Abgar, king of Edessa, became the first Christian king, and faith in Jesus spread across the East. As a Syrian, we were the first believer in Jesus Christ, and so we are like, just like the generation left from those days until now. And as I uh, myself, uh, I grew up in, uh, as a Syrian uh, family, and uh, we have always went to church, you know, after my parents and their uh, parents. And as you see, my, my kids are still following the same path that my great-great-grandfathers did until nowadays, and I hope it will continue until, you know, in turn. My name is Marianne Abraham, and I am a member of the Holy Apostolic Catholic Assyrian Church of the East. The Church of the East, the Assyrian Church of the East, is one of the oldest churches around. Um, I was born and raised in this church. Growing up, we didn't have a choice whether or not we wanted to come to church. We came. My mom wanted to instill in us the love of Christ and the love of going to church. Her grandfather was a priest. And one thing that I remember she, her telling us from when we were really young, and I want to say I was maybe about 10 or 11 years old, she goes, I see so many people around here who were born and raised in this church but don't understand. She goes, you are not a rock. You are a human being. You were meant to participate. This is for the rest of your life. This has to be a part of your life. My name is Jamil Jundi, and I've been a Syrian church, Margi Wargis, and I've been working here for many years to do my duty in the church. That's with the U.S. military. I was an interpreter with the U.S. military and then first ID and third ID, and I was in Samara. And Samara is a, like a very hot place was that time. And uh, we did our, our, our job there for the uh, USA government. And we thank us for that job we did. And uh, we came back to United States still life. My name is Father George Suleiman, or in Assyrian they call me Father Giwergi Suleiman. I am the parish priest of uh, Mar Giwergi's Cathedral, which is St. George Cathedral in English. Church is about people, you know, getting people, not to get to know people, be close to them, and and then people will, you know, will enjoy coming to your church, will enjoy worshiping with you. That's how we started it in Syria, and uh, God always put in my way people who who taught me something, even like a little bit, small things, but those things, you know, add up uh, to make me who I am today. I personally believe that when we pray in Aramaic, it's not just what we say, but it's that, you know, we are connecting with, you know, with this, through this language. Language is a very powerful thing. We are connecting with this language through a lineage of all these believers from the beginning of Christianity till today. This is to me the most important thing, to love, each, you know, your neighbors, to love each other, to come close to each other and you know we learned a lot from this nation and they can learn a lot from us. We're the same, we really are. It's just a reflection of culture I think more than anything. I mean we're taught to show people the love of Christ, the unconditional love of Christ and you know we're taught to understand that God is the center of our world and we're taught that we need to love our neighbors and we're taught to fast and pray and to ask God for guidance. And I feel like those, those themes are you know, common in every church. Um, so there's cultural differences, but we're the same. Living in Chicago, we encounter so many people of so many different faith traditions in our workplace, in our places of education, uh, walking down the street, sharing a bus, who knows where you become friends with people. But do we ever really know their origins, where they came from, what their tradition is? If we meet people from Egypt, do we just assume that they're Muslim? Or do we engage them in conversation? And once we engage in conversation, and might find out that they're Coptic. Well, what does that mean? And is there a way then that 
we who live in the cultural West can experience part of what it means to be a Coptic Christian. Is there, is there a festival? Is there a feast? Is there something that you can share with me? Although Orthodox is in their title, we're still not in full communion with one another. And we pray that one day that that will be resolved. Christ established one church. Most people know about the schism of 1054 between what has now become the Roman Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox or Greek Orthodox churches. Those expressions of Christianity grew in their cultural milieus, in their different parts of the world, and they highlighted different expressions of Christianity, how they worshiped. And it, there's a Latin expression that says, lex arende and lex credende, the rule of faith is expressed in the rule of worship. What we believe is expressed through our worship. So you see a different kind of worship in the Eastern traditions and you do in the Western traditions. My name is Rebecca Michaels. I'm a member of St. Mark Coptic Orthodox Church here in Chicago. We have claims to be one of the oldest Christian churches in the world. Our evangelist is St. Mark the Apostle. So St. Mark was one of the 70 original apostles that's mentioned in the Gospels. After the crucifixion of Christ, he went back to his homeland, which is northern Africa, Libya and Egypt, and he brought Christianity. It was welcomed in Egypt, and Christianity spread and flourished there. We believe that our Pope uh, today, Pope Tawadros II, is the 118th successor of St. Mark, direct succession. If you take the ancient Egyptian language, the hieroglyphic language, Coptic essentially is the hieroglyphic language using Greek letters. They used to call us Egyptos, which is a Greek word, which eventually evolved into the word Coptic. I'm a first generation born Egyptian. I was born here in Chicago, and this church um, that we are sitting in now is uh, my church. A lot of Americans put a lot of emphasis on freedom of speech, freedom of the press. These are all very, very important basic constitutional rights. But I would say for Coptic Christians, the separation of church and state is invaluable. This is something that we believe um, maybe a lot of Americans may take for granted because they um, are allowed to practice their religion freely or are allowed to not practice religion at all. The architecture of all Coptic churches must be based on one of three plans. The shape of a cross, the shape of an arc, or the shape of the circle, which represents the Eucharist, no beginning and no end. What you see here is an iconostasis, that's what we call it. It has uh, all of the icons and it separates the apse from the main part of the sanctuary. Behind the curtain is the nave. The icons of the Coptic tradition are very simplistic in nature and mean to tell a story. We see the gold leaf. There are no borders on Coptic icons. The gold leaf goes from side to side and top to bottom. The most important thing to know about Coptic iconography is that you will always see Christ, the teacher, on the right, and um, the Virgin Mary with baby Jesus on the left. The patron saint of the church should also go on the iconostasis. In this particular case, it's St. Mark. St. Mark is always depicted with a lion because the story goes that he met a lion in the wilderness and was able to tame the lion, and so he's always depicted with a lion. Behind me is the sanctuary. Only a priest or an ordained deacon um, can enter this, this place. However, as mentioned previously, um, the veil is open to the congregation, which represents the unity of Christ with the people uh, after the crucifixion. We as cops believe that the divinity and humanity of Christ never separated, neither for a moment or a twinkling of an eye. We depict Jesus Christ on the heavenly throne um, to show that there is no separation between the Father and the Son. Here we have the Virgin Mary uh, with baby Jesus. And as you can see, um, people have uh, will write um, prayers and um, stick them on the icon, light a candle, um, and ask for the intercession of the Virgin Mary. Inside the reliquary, we'll have a relic, which is a piece of clothing or a piece of the body of one of the saints that uh, we take blessings from. 
We are standing in the baptistry of the church. The baptistry architecturally will always be placed outside of the church because people who have not been baptized have not been admitted into the rites of the church. We baptize our babies at the age of 40 days for a boy, 80 days for a girl. And if you're a convert, an adult convert to Christianity, you would also be baptized in this baptistry. Our roots go back to the first century and uh, we kept the faith from generation to generation as it was handed to us by Saint Mark the Apostle. And uh, we fought for that for so many centuries. And since Christian, Christianity entered into Egypt, it, it has never been easy with the Christian people in Egypt. We're one of the oldest churches in the world. We value our Christianity more than life itself. We fought for it. We shed blood for it for years. And we thank God for the persecution that the church has faced because this is, this is the reason that our church has not changed in 2,000 years. Chicago is probably the largest religiously diverse city in the world. I think that's one of the greatest reasons people come to Chicago. It's religiously diverse, it's accepting, it's ethnically diverse, and uh, there's a lot of Orthodox Christians here already, Greeks especially. I think it's a, an awakening, if you will, for Western Christians living in the United States to realize that there are ancient traditions and ancient faiths and the ancient Christian faith alive and well, persecuted, heavily persecuted in the Middle East, and it's something that we need to acknowledge and be aware of. My name is Father Aren Jebedjan. I'm the pastor of St. Gregory the Illuminator Armenian Orthodox Church here in Chicago. It's tremendous to be able to share my faith with my community and they share their faith experience with me. The Armenian Church is one of the ancient churches. The story begins in the latter part of the third century. A group of nuns who were fleeing from the emperor Diocletian happened to stumble within the kingdom of Armenia. And King Dirtad was to return them back to Diocletian for punishment because they were spreading the word of Christianity. Upon capturing them, his eyes gazed upon one of the most beautiful women he had ever seen, the nun, Ripsime, and immediately fell head over heels in love with her and asked her to become his queen. Ripsime said, well, I'm a Christian and how could I ever marry a pagan? The answer was no, and in a fit of rage, King Dirtad had them all slaughtered immediately, all 40 nuns. And Gregory, who was a secret Christian, uh, the king decided that he was going to sentence Gregory to death and had him thrown into a deep, dark pit. When the king, realizing that he had killed the most beautiful woman that he had ever uh, gazed his eyes upon, uh, he went insane. And the king's sister, who was a secret Christian herself, knew that Gregory was alive in that pit. And so after 13 years, he was brought out of the pit. He prayed over King Dirtad. He was miraculously cured. And the king said, I want to believe in your God. As the pastor of uh, St. Gregory, I am really blessed with so, so many faith-filled families. You know, a church is a church, and it's wonderful. And, you know, unfortunately, some people think that this is where we get our spirituality. No, in the Armenian tradition, the spirituality comes from the home. A home blessing in the Armenian tradition uh, takes place after the five major feast days. Typically, we have bread, salt, and water, which are the basic necessities of life. What makes a home is the family. And so we bless the three basic necessities of life and then sit down and we share a meal together. I think the importance of Armenia goes back to our roots um, and our family as we have three generations of Armenians here. Um, it has meant uh, perseverance through difficult times. Um, when my father was a survivor of the genocide, um, came to this country uh, in 1920, after having survived the genocide and having had his um, entire family uh, perish, he was the sole survivor. And it made, he used his faith and belief 
and confidence and perseverance um, to survive in this country and to um, provide ample opportunities to myself and obviously to our family now. And it's that perseverance that I think all Armenians possess. Faith means everything. If you have the faith, then everything uh, follow that. If you believe in the Bible, you read the Bible, you believe in God and all the faith, according to that, you follow your life. Family means everything. Closeness, everything comes from the family. That's the foundation of your future, your everything. Family is important because it's a great foundation to really learn and grow your faith. Um, you, know, you start at a young age learning about the teachings and the Bible and just you know being in a family that's uh, very religious and you know very focused on what Christ has taught us is a really good way to grow. I truly believe that the Armenian heritage is that never give up spirit yes. and that is so ingrained yes. in the history of the Armenians. My father went through the genocide in Turkey. Uh, it is a story common to many, many Armenians. He's not alone. Over a million and a half Armenians were massacred. Uh, his family died. His father was taken away. He survived. He survived. He was saved by the uh, American Red Cross in an Armenian church and, and had the opportunity to come to this country. And his story is not a unique story. It is, it is ingrained, I truly believe, in, in the Armenian spirit and the ability of people with that shared background to come here, to thrive, to do well, to build upon that never give up spirit. I truly believe is an attribute of Armenians. As you look at the, at the uh, community as a whole, when you take a community as diverse and as broad and as vibrant as Chicago, it is a, a significant element of that community and reflects that community in that never give up spirit. The most fun thing about being an Armenian is the food. We have such delicious food, so much great cooking, the quantities of food. Also, it's the preparation of the food. It's not just the eating of the food. And the first time when Talar came to be with us for a weekend, when Mark and Talar had been dating, and we were so lucky when she came here to be with us, and we were in the kitchen, and it was the first time she was meeting us, and there were three generations. There was Kay, my mother-in-law, myself, and Talar. And the three women just blended so beautifully in the kitchen. It had been like we had been together all of our life. It was just seamless how we worked together. So we were preparing Armenian food together to nourish our bodies and souls. And then we broke bread and said grace and had a meal together. And I'll just never forget how special that was. Father Aaron is coming here tonight to do a home blessing in our home. And it's always a very special occasion when he comes here to perform that. Um, when he performs the blessing, we have water, salt, and bread that he will bless with his cross. And we will have incense being um, lit at the time. And what's special with that is then afterwards, Mark will go around the house with the incense and to take it into every room. So once again, it's a privilege to be here to bless your home. And of course, in the Armenian tradition, we bless bread, salt, and water, the three necessities of life. Um, and thereby, by blessing them, we are blessed. And consuming these, these items, we are blessed ourselves. Um, special prayers and hymns are sung and said and there will be some a Bible reading. So it's very special. You, traditionally, in the Armenian tradition, you do it um, 40 days after Christmas or 40 days after Easter. People really get lost in the, the ceremony, and there's a lot to it. Father Aaron is just like part of our family. Um, we love him dearly, and he's had an important influence on all of us. That's very important things for Armenian house, that bless all. We have to have a blessing home. It's important that uh, people of faith, whether they're Jewish or Muslim or Christian, reach out to their neighbors, reach out to others, and try to better understand who they are, who uh, where their roots come from. Uh, because uh, we live in a society that we put up walls and we, we text one another. Nobody can learn anything about a person uh, through a text message. Uh, you learn about someone through dialogue, through 
uh, listening. Listening is the most important thing. Not just uh, telling and saying, this is who I am, but then saying, well, who are you? Uh, I'd like to find out more about who you are, your tradition. How do you pray? What is it that you believe in? Um, and that's how really, in the ecumenical movement, we become stronger by realizing who we are. I can't share who I am uh, with you unless I know my faith very well. And so it's important that we reach out to one another. Uh, go visit an Armenian church. Go visit a Coptic church. Uh, listen and open your hearts to, to how they experience their relationship with God. And it's going to make you a better person. It's going to make me a better person. Uh, it's going to make Chicago a better place and the world a better place. We should drop those sensitivities and hidden discomfort between denominations. And we should go deep to the core of Christianity, which is love. I think the best way that a person living in the cultural West can experience the Eastern tradition is probably through their pain, is to understand that when we talk about the Egypt, and we talk about the rise of fundamental Islam and the change of government, and sometimes we think that that change of government is good for Egypt, we have to realize that there are Eastern Orthodox and and Coptic Christians living there who will suffer greatly. They're practically decimated today. And we know nothing about it because we choose not to, because we hear a louder voice. We don't hear a quiet voice. So I think we need to be open to the voices. We need to experience those joys and sorrows of the other. And we need somehow to reach out to that neighbor, that friend, that acquaintance, and as the late great patriarch Athenagoras of Constantinople said, look into each other's eyes. We're glad you've been with us for this special edition of Sanctuary on the fabric of Eastern Christianity. Your thoughts and reactions to issues and ideas at the intersection of life and faith are important to us, and we want to hear from you. Email us at gcbm at ameritech.net. Visit our website at gcbm.org and write to us at Sanctuary in care of the Greater Chicago Broadcast Ministries, 77 West Washington, Chicago, Illinois, 60602. That's Sanctuary, the Greater Chicago Broadcast Ministries, 77 West Washington Street, Chicago, Illinois, 60602. I'm Lydia Talbot. Thanks for keeping faith with us today on Sanctuary. May peace be with you. Thank you.